All right, so we'll do some context setting. And I have a few quotes up there. Christians should be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better work than buying pardons. And then this was in reform, so I've used this in reform. Grace has nothing to do with unworthiness and everything to do with story and power. Take your story and eat it. This poet is, uh, what's, how you pronounce his name? Uh, Padre Gautama. Okay, good, that poet um, uh, said that. So, um, I'm going to begin by saying, first of all, why a reforming imagination? You can say that both, it's both a blessing and a bane in Europe, given Europe's enlightenment, and a blessing in terms of the much we have received and where we are at, and the bane being that despite of all our intellectual development, all the wonderful philosophical and religious traditions, in spite of our literacy, there is one impoverishment, an illiteracy of the imagination that keeps us pinned in a rut. I'm referring to what the Caribbean writer and intellectual Wilson Harris refers to as exactly this, an illiteracy of the imagination. We cannot underestimate how the mind and the imagination has been colonized over the centuries. Recently, <clears throat> Moshin Hamid, author of The Reluctant Fundamentalist, in an interview with Graham Greene of The New Internationalist, seemed to make a similar observation, and I quote, At the moment, we are seeing a failure of imagination. No one is articulating plausible, desirable future for us as human beings. What we are hearing articulated is, that life will be terrible in the future, or vehemently nostalgic, divisive, chauvinistic visions. End of quote. I think a timely reminder is this, in all our attempts to focus on remembering and celebrating past and momentous events. 2017, as the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, is no exception. You would know that the 16th century Europe witnessed political, intellectual, and cultural, and religious upheaval that reshaped Europe and what followed, setting in place structures, beliefs, and values, ethos that would not only define the continent in the modern era, but also its missional and ecclesial exports to the ends of the earth. The Reformation happened in the context of empires and allegiances, and at a time of much hatred corruption and division, including conflicts about political autonomy, aristocratic patronage, political and ideological influences, spatial diffusion, whether it was proximity, what one neighbors, uh, what one neighbors have adopted, or the distance to Wittenberg or Geneva. That all influenced the Reformation. The church, as the body of Christ, was caught in the coils of a false freedom and community. The medieval world had become a suffocating system in which people no longer felt free to be themselves or to thrive. They were at the mercy of an ecclesial institution which purported to free people by indulgences which only the few could afford and which encouraged people's self-indulgence at the expense of God's word and of God's people. So the whole religious and political system of the time had become enslaving and degrading. It is the case that wherever the Reformation took hold of, the ruling elite managed to wrest power from the church. There is enough evidence to suggest that the Protestant Reformation affected development in all spheres of life across Europe in varying ways. It would be reasonable to ask, to what extent did a Protestant ethos reshape Europe and contributed to the contemporary European project? That answer will vary. Brent F. Nelson and James L. Guth, for instance, in their essay, Religion in the European Union, The Forgotten Factor, makes a fascinating case on how the European project was born out of the concerns of Catholic statesmen, preoccupied with creating permanent peace among the warring tribes of Europe, with the ideological rationale having deep Catholic roots. 
Now, these scholars contend that whether taking cues from Demo Christian democratic politicians or church leaders, Catholic laity were by far the most enthusiastic backers of European unity. And the more devout the Catholic, the stronger the pro-unity views. On the other hand, the Protestant reaction to the developing integration process was quite different. Protestant states have constantly resisted handing sovereignty to federal institutions. It is even the curious case today that the national leaders resisting deeper economic and political integration are of a Protestant heritage from Britain, Sweden, Netherlands, Denmark, and even Germany. Hence, the influence of confessional cultures on the European project should not be underestimated as it continues to shape European institutions. And the Protestant influence is not insignificant, especially as it relates to integration as autonomy is given higher agency. So the authors noted, and I quote, the more Protestant a country, the less often it joins efforts to integrate more deeply. Even controlling for national wealth and the timing of accession to the EU, Protestant countries are much more reluctant to engage in voluntary integration. Hence, the presence of skeptical Protestants produces more scrutiny by parliamentary committees protecting the national interests. Now, I have put that there because I think this is a significant observation, whether we agree with it or not for another conversation on especially a Protestant Reformation influence in or on contemporary Europe. Now, undoubtedly, the European reformers challenged, troubled, questioned, and changed much. At the same time, there was also much that were reinscribed, shut down, and marginalized in the reformers' own effort to manage confessional positions, geopolitics, and various alliances. This gathering is interested in the impulses around a reforming imagination, the complexities and the compromises of or by its deployment then and over the years and the relevance and challenges of a, ref of a reforming habit for today. Now, should a reformer be nailing some thesis today, what would these be? Speaking as a minority within a minority ecclesial tradition, that is supposed to be both uniting and reforming, I will explore the shape of a reforming imagination for today. As the General Secretary of the WCC reminds us, and I quote, we need to draw the best values of the Reformation and make them a living reality today. And these values will energize as we deploy them, as the basis and source for serving the lives of other human beings today for the good of one humanity. End of quote. Thus, the call of the Reformation for today is one of turning or repenting, which is not a call to despair, pessimism, or misconceptions of the possibilities of human life and efforts. Rather, it is a call to be inspired by the liberating word of the gospel. For the sake of all, such a call needs imagining that our world can be a different place. So, why a reforming imagination? I am drawn to a reforming imagination for various reasons. I am assured by the views expressed by Catherine Tanner that, and I quote, where a theologian ends up is more important than where she starts. And where she starts is no guarantee where she will end up. The first reason is my involvement in a task group of the Council of Protestant Churches in Europe and how to receive and relate to migrant churches from the Protestant family from the developing world. Now, the key observation here is that a body committed to Reformation principles and mostly welcoming of the other on paper finds it extremely difficult to accept these Reformed churches as part of the family with a legitimate place around the table of our common belonging. Somehow, they are not what Ruben Alves referred to as right doctrine Protestants, and they are culturally dodgy to sit around the table as equals. The second concern is about the still reforming series, which has now ended, about Reformation and London's doorsteps. 
Now, granted, it's an invitation from British and Continental churches in London to celebrate the Reformation heritage. The imagination could not be stretched to include Ghanaians, Koreans, Taiwanese, Brazilians, and others of the Protestant Reformed tradition and their churches in London, some here from the late 40s and early 50s. More than a missed opportunity, what this reveals is a mindset that is unable to see and give agency of the ongoing reformation in our midst. All of the celebrating to date is a Eurocentric, largely white male affair. Now, the third reason is my most recent visit to the Synod of the Waldensian and Methodist churches in Turipilece, Italy, revisiting the history of this pre-Reformation community and being privileged to see their collection of both very early Reformation texts on display in order of the 500 years of the Reformation. But what really struck me were the greetings brought by ecumenical guests of the Protestant family, who all quickly highlighted the Waldensians' work with the refugees in Italy while either consciously or unconsciously missing the significance of the Waldensians' pre-Reformation reforming mindset. Perhaps the story of the Waldensians disrupts the neat accounts of Calvin and Luther, and as a persecuted minority, they were largely seen as early heretics and marginal voices. So that's something that really struck me there. Maybe Luca would agree or disagree. My fourth reason is a recent protest by two very close minister colleagues here in the URC whose conscience led them to publicly protest the recent armed phrase in London with the possibility of being arrested. When my church authorities were alerted to this, they work on the synod moderator to inform the ministers that should they be arrested, they then would have to ensure a disciplinary process that will be put in place as required by the law. Now, I can see that as a fair thing to do. No one from the leadership either affirmed the protest as a prophetic act, nor even bothered to consider that our basis of union underscores the right of conscience to dissent and protest. This is one example of how freedom and autonomy, core principles of the Protestant Reformation, are being policed. We need to put protest back into Protestantism. Is into Protestantism. Now, the General Secretary of um, CTE, David Cornick, in a short piece titled Ref "Reflections on the President's Statement about the 500th Anniversary of the Reformation," noted the following, and it's a long quote, so I quote. Our first reason for rejoicing is that we can see how the heritage of the 16th century has affected the history of the world. This perspective is important. The second reason to rejoice is that we look back through the lens of a century and more of ecumenical activity. The Reformation was grounded in a passion for reform to conform more precisely to the mind of Christ. That was the impetus behind Luther's rediscovery of the Pauline concept of justification by faith and also of the work of the Catholic Council of Trent. End of quote. Now what I find interesting is what is missing from Cornick's reflection. And it is any recognition of the relationship between the Protestant Reformation and the changing intercultural landscape of Europe and especially Britain. It is as if, on one hand, there's an argument from the colleagues for the world impact of Reformation, while at the same time, total design on awareness or erasure or no agency given to the voices from outside, outside the usual and traditional European ecclesial world right at our doorsteps. Until this gathering, I think all of the celebrating in the UK and Europe merely served to reframe an undeconstructed deconstructed deconstructed white narrative hence this is another reason why i'm interested in this conversation now allow me to do a few reasons some of the things i want to nail on on, on the door of the church or our church's door the first being the protestant reformation tenets insight into a reforming imagination i'm going to start with this 
In every period of church history, the Christian faith, whether because of its own distortion of the so-called original vision or external pressure from the changing reality around, has had to address itself to specific human anxieties and the questions this throw up and then offer and find a way to respond. Every age this happens. This is a key dynamic to renewal in church life. The tendency, though, is one of mighty resistance as attempts are made to defend the status quo at all costs. Now, I've referred to it already, but in the book Protestantism and Repression, a Brazilian case study, in 1979, Ruben Alves contend that what results is a right doctrine position with a greater insistence on biblical inerrancy, more rigid doctrinal formulations, the absolute, absolute, absolutizing of certain prescriptive, prescriptive ethical norms and tighter ecclesiastical discipline. Now, this was evident in the Roman Catholic Church's response to Luther and the Reformers, as it was Luther and Calvin's response to the radical Reformers. To preserve and sustain a right doctrine position meant a greater insistence on biblical inerrancy, more rigid ethical doctrinal formulations, the absolute, absolute, I can't pronounce the word, the absolutizing of certain prescriptive ethical norms, ethical norms and tighter ecclesiastical discipline. Thus, within this operational dynamic, the Protestant linchpin of freedom and intolerance is negated and thrown overboard. So we may ask, when Protestants speak of semper reformanda, are we still operating within a logic that majors on confirming or on conformity making of the divine some granite from idol, chaining the maverick movement of the spirit? Can the church respond to the changing landscape of today, pressures within and pressures outside without stifling openness, creativity, and freedom of dissent? And what can we draw from the early reforming impulses to fire up a reforming imagination for today? So the first area I want to reflect on is the commodification of whole of life. Money rules and talks as something that we need to be mindful of. And there is a quote from Luther. Christians should be taught that he who sees a person in need and passes him by and then purchases pardons and purchases, purchases not the indulgences of the Pope, but the indignation of God. A movement needs message and traction. And the Reformation found both as it connected powerfully with the view that what matters uh, is associated with the faith, sorry, that the matters of associated with the faith were pushed into the marketplace. All of Luther's 95 Theses question why that which has been given for free mark freely were suddenly becoming a commodity. Forgiveness, life, future, and more. Where is any logic in selling something that does not belong to you if it's free? That's the market and commodification for us. And the teachings of the church and a warped theology to underpin it created a situation of demand and supply. Any attempt to disrupt that business deal should not underestimate the extent to which church would go to crush the heresies, as they then named it. Before Luther, one of the earliest attempts came from the Waldensians in the 12th and 13th centuries, who rejected open displays of wealth among churchmen. With a falling in France, Spain, and Italy, the church and its secular agents brutally suppressed them wherever their influence grew too large. Ultimately, the church enacted a decree by death, sorry, of death, by burning against Waldensians at the Council of Gerona in 11, 1197. Their 15th century successors, the Lollards, who advocated the ideas of John Wycliffe against avaricious clergy met a similar fate. An even larger challenge from the Prague preacher John Hus, 1372 to 1415, who led a Bohemian movement, early 15th century, and spoke against the sinful nature of church leaders and the avaricious nature of church practices felt the wrath of church and secular leaders. The suppression meant loss of lives 
burning at the stake. Now, the challenge from all these movements and individuals against greed, corruption, oppression of the poor, and the commodification of all of life, with a call of seeking a return to scriptures or the biblical origins of the church, was a theological spiritual one, as it was a moral wake-up call. And the interests of competing agents of empire, as seen in the Gill's men, the burghers and others reflected sometimes a commitment to Reformation principles, though more than often taking astute political gambles that favor their own well-being and their own privilege. The Reformation's recognition of human depravity and the proclivity to wrong the other is a timely reminder, given the many current incarnations and embodiment of greed in the idea and the ideology and the practice of the free market enterprise, which is consuming all of us. Even the refugee crisis or situation has been hijacked by the profit motive. It is not only people smugglers, who some see as saviors and exploiters at the same time, it is also a complicity church and state in outsourcing our moral conscience to private enterprise and groups to do the work of managing the situation. The point, for our purpose though, is that a reforming imagination is a moral one that chants down the view and practice that everything is tradable. The oikonomia, the economy of our common life, must be held accountable to the economy of God in Christ. The latter inverts the logic of a market economy with a different set of values, sharing Gay, in other words, sharing is about gaining, and sorry, sharing is about losing. It's about sharing, gaining is losing. It's about a giveaway God that we worship rather than wanting to, to receive or to always um, have something with a profit motive. So the economy of God in Christ is one of the moral challenge before us. I quickly also want to look at justification by grace as a point that we need to reflect on through faith. Now, I'm drawing heavily from Ruben Alves, who wrote 26 years ago, and again I quote, Protestantism at its birth did introduce a discourse with a new set of themes, and that this discourse clashed with the prevailing ideological and theological arguments. This is no dispute. That is the case he's saying. <coughs> These themes have been summed up as the four solas, scriptura, scripture, grace, faith, and Christ. Justification by grace is the key one. The message of justification by grace through faith conveys that we are saved not because of who we are and what we do, but because of who God is and what God does. So for an inclusive community, the rereading of justification ought to make our table space one for all. The whole of creation, not some or part of it, both horizontal and vertical. Now the principle underscores that different groups of Christians who share faith in Jesus belong together. It talks about mutual commitment and shared belonging without either party being better or more important. In other words, a church that believes in justification um, writes welcome not only on the notice board or service sheet, but on the hearts of all of the gathered community. All belong truly and fully. At least, this is what it should be like. Now, the sad reality is that while the intention underscores access to all, as grace is a gift from the divine, we have in our theologies, confessions, and creed unwittingly, or maybe knowingly, inscribe a sort of regulation of this grace in a variety of ways. Hence, the welcome of strangers and migrants and migrant people of faith, Muslims, Roma, people, colleagues from LGBTI <coughs> communities, women, disabled, among many other minority groups, they continue to challenge the ecclesial traditions. It seems that some are more human than others. They may be justified, only almost, and they have work, they have to work exceptionally, that is the church, or the colleagues would have to work exceptionally and unjustly harder, rather, the colleagues have to work, or these marginal groups have to almost, have to work exceptionally and unjustly harder to prove that they belong. 
Belonging is never being renegotiated around our widening table. So, adherence to justification by grace through faith has to have political implications. I think so. As black theologian James Cohn noted, because God has acted for all, all people are free. Free to respond creatively to that act. This is easier said than articulated and lived down. Now the early reformers themselves got caught out as they quickly reverted to shut down the freedom they argued for. The point for us is to reflect on the following. What from the deposits of the Protestant Reformation needs to be deconstructed, reconstructed or dumped for its corrupting and exclusionary impact? Is betrayal of sola gracia. Are our traditions and moorings carved out of granite or shaped by grace? How can we reason justification in the context of sophisticated and systemic robbery and murder by corporate and their agents of debt? What we have received from the Protestant tradition, uh, Protestant Reformation heritage is not value free. So a reforming imagination needs to critically engage with the deposits of the heritage, asking of ourselves whose interests do our confessional statements, our doctrines, our um, positions and human relationship privilege and protect. Is it the church? Is it the vulnerable people? Is it the status quo? Is it the way of Jesus? The reformers did just that in their times, examining some of their deposits in their work around deconstructing and reconstructing. The ways in which they in turn redrew and erected fence boundaries and reinscribed the inside-outsider dynamic ought to flag up for us the need to both review their advocacy of freedom and the Semper Reformanda agenda. I mean, this is, this is a simple point that the, being that we, uh, the reformers struggled or they argued for this freedom and in order to draw their own boundaries, they, they did that and then in the process excluded others whom they consider too radical or going too much to the extreme or contrary to the gospel. So the very freedom they fought for or the very freedom they argued for, they quickly reinscribed boundaries around it. So it raises question about the limits to inclusion and diversity and what this is all about. Now, the last area I want to talk about is living as free people. Now, the world of the reformers was seeing a transition to a new consciousness and the extension of the boundaries of their known world, mediated through the discovered printed word. One can understand the feeling of autonomy to create a larger vision of themselves and what may be possible. Yet the question is that Luther wrestled with, how shall I find a gracious, merciful God? That question remains. How can we experience freedom both to be our authentic selves and to live a vocation of freedom for others in order to make the world that beloved community at ho a home for all in a mutually shared life together. Now the reforming revolution which faith in Christ brings is always freedom before God which at the same is at the same time freedom before and for neighbors. Luther was never tired of quoting Paul. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, the question I want to ask or ask myself, is the Reformation still for liberation and community? To what extent have the four solas, gracia, fide, scriptura, or solus Christus, liberated the church and its people. The current status quo, uh, sorry, the current evidence around us, including much of past history following the Protestant Reformation, is suggesting to me that the question is still very pertinent. Can I find a gracious neighbor or how can I be a gracious neighbor? I think that question still remains. Now, the Reformation broke the power of the supremacy of the church and its institutions and replaced it with the power of civil authority in Europe and consequently across the world. Human beings and nations claimed and gained their freedom and autonomy 
But what have we done with this freedom and autonomy? Individuals, nations and groups of privileged people have reinscribed the indul indulgences of various kinds, political indulgences, through powerful imposing their will on the weak, racial and economic indulgences through brutal domination of the many by the few or of the few by the many, and the feeding of greed in a consumer society, personal indulgences through self-obsession, self-distractions, religious indulgences by escaping either into esoteric experiences or into hard confessional positions which rely on law, sorry, which rely on law and works. And what is tragic about all of this, but not surprising, as the, is that the church is part of it. Though inheritors of the treasure of God's liberating word, we have allowed ourselves to reflect the slavery of structures of thinking, attitudes, and actions of the surrounding community we are located in. A reforming imagination must reclaim and rediscover that freedom is for, is for a freeing vocation, even if it means <coughs> critical self-interrogation and giving up privileges we have both inhabited and enjoy and may be oblivious of. I'll skip some of the other bits I've written because I also spoke of a reform and reforming imagination. And I have a quote there from Ruben Alves that those who already possess the truth are destined to become inquisitors. Inquisitors? Yeah, inquisitors. Those who have only doubts are predestined to tolerance and perhaps to the burning to, to the burning at stake. The whole idea of being, we're supposed to be this reform and reforming tradition, and then what, what has happened is that instead of becoming um, reforming, we have become static, and just a reiterating of some of the points I've made, and then reinscribe what ought to be right doctrine, Protestant understanding and belief, and in the process, the only part of the Reformation, we some of the colleagues got burnt at stake or being considered as radical reformers had to run for their lives from the very people themselves, you know, who argued for this freedom and for a reformer reforming tradition. So the point I was making in that section is that reforming um, imagination must be an ongoing vocation that ought to start with self-interrogation and live out, you know, any mantra of surrendering all to Jesus. So it must be lived out for us to diminish so that Christianity, sorry, so that Christ may increase and not Christianity. So I, I'll draw this to an end by looking at, well, what are some of the things I'm thinking about a reforming imagination? Now, what has happened to the energy and movement of the Protestant cry for freedom? Its initial vision of back to the gospel, the spirit of revolt, protest against institutionalized orders, its high agency on the sacredness of individual conscience, as seen that my church articulates, the United Reformed Church, its making of the whole world a sacramental. Where is the freedom of inquiry in rereading scriptures? Ultimate, the ultimate authority for the reformers. As people of the Paracletos, a Pentecostal community, what has happened to us? Perhaps we need to rediscover our doxological habit, praising. We began with a psalm to praise, which is countercultural act, actually. Blessed are you. Blessed you are. Blessed are us. Perhaps money and the market economy, the commodification of the whole of life, is causing us not to see. If we are part of the so called simul justice et peccator tradition, in what ways are we prepared to sin boldly? or indecently in our theological reimaginings? What is the critical existential question that a reforming imagination must take on? For here I stand, we can do no otherwise. Now, the Protestant Reformation, as the presidents of the Churches Together in England wrote, they say, is a time of rejoicing, of remembering, of reforming, of repenting, of reconciling. I think these are all significant to a reforming imagination. <coughs> But I also think that that reforming imagination must be shaped and driven by grace and must regain its sense of adventure, movement, intellectual desire, and openness to the spontaneous, unpredictable, and mischievous movement of the Holy Spirit. 
I mean, whether it's an ecumenical uh, World Council of Churches, whether it's United Reformed Church, whether it's a, another community, what started out as a movement or what starts out as a move movement, there's always a tendency to become static and we lose the sense of movement. I think we need to discover, a reforming imagination is pleading to us, let's discover the sense of, of, of movement. A reforming imagination will critically interrogate its inherited deposits of faith and tradition, both capital T and common T, and dare to throw off or dump all that passes as its DNA, yet shackling the body of Christ to restrictive thinking and habits. I think that this is a massive challenge before the church. I mean, I look at my own church. If you look at all the documentations that come to General Assembly, if you look at our basis of union, there is a heteronormative way in which all these things are presented. We need to look again at them and maybe push our inclusionary habits to say that what are the things that we need just to throw away and, and, and to really mean what we are saying and to reflect it in all of our writings. I think that this here is a big challenge so to, to dumb things and when you say people are thinking no but we still need of course we need tradition but tradition shouldn't enslave us. A reforming imagination must be shaped by the lived realities of the vulnerable addressing sins of racism, sexism, xenophobia, and all related forms of hatred, allowing such experiences to redefine the church's leadership, mission, and praxis. A reforming imagination will chant down the view and practice that everything is tradable, the commodification of the whole of life, always advancing an economy of God, that inverts the logic of a market economy with a different set of values. Now, this is a challenge to me, this is a challenge to all of us because we live by this market economy, but we have to do something. And, 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 and what the gospel is offering us is a way out. How do, we, how do we break out? A reforming imagination will reclaim and rediscover our freedom is for freeing vocation, even if it means critical self-interrogation and giving up privileges we have both inhabited and enjoy. So the whole idea of examining privilege, I, I'm a, I may be a minority in one case, but I'm also a privileged person because I have access to lots of things. But So what are the privileges I need to give up in order that others may share the space that <coughs> around the table? That's, that's important to us as well. And I think that a reforming imagination will embrace and embody habits of grace and graciousness as it again interrogates, pushes boundaries, transgress borders and walls, undress power and privilege, touch all aspects of our life together, include all, be open to the mischievous surprise of the spirit, recognizes his own, and this is important, recognizes his own limitations, otherwise it reinscribes the very thing it wants to debunk, um, and must never ever attempt to bring closure on the divine, not the ways of the divine. So I've tried to nail some thesis, even though I've ended up with the men and I didn't want to start that way. What are some of yours that are reforming imagination today should stir us to nail on the doors of our ecclesial edifices and systems? And so I end there. Thank you very much. Oh, you know, I'm, oh, oh, oh.